just got the vibe, guys. Okay, so currently reporting from Redlands, California, about an hour east of downtown LA. This city is about, I don't know, 10 minutes from my house and it's the only proper downtown area if you want to grab like coffee or some fancy dinner or whatever. So here I am for option A, which was a quick coffee break. And I figured it was a good chance to show you guys around. It's kind of cool if you've never been here and also discuss the last three days in terms of my poker life where I spent at the Bicycle Hotel and Casino playing some 2550, sometimes 2550, 100. You guys know how the straddle goes. Anyway, it was, uh, it was a pretty action-packed week for me. I'll just say that without spoiling anything. But uh, yeah, the first day was kind of chill. The second day, Garrett played and the game was naturally a little bit bigger and so were the swings. And then the third day, Friday, which was yesterday, I finally played what I thought were uh, some more interesting hands. But anyway, that's enough talk for now. Let's head right into the first stream because there's quite a lot of hands to go over. All right, guys, here we are starting off the night with stream number one, playing some 25.50 with a $50 big blind Annie, and I decide to sit with $50,000. And the first interesting hand, yours truly, is in the $100 straddle. There's an open from L in middle position to 300. KGB calls in the big blind, and I call with 9.8 offsuit. A little bit questionable, but with KGB calling in the big blind and the fact that there's a big blind Annie out there, I think it's fine. Anyway, we go three ways to a flop of ace, seven, four with a flush draw. Action checks around and we turn an open-ended straight draw with the six of clubs. Big blind checks again and now it's on me. I think on a board like this, I can have a lot of strong stuff as well as some bluffs. So for that reason, I decide to come out and bet. In terms of sizing, I think my bet will represent either a very strong hand or nothing at all since if I just had top pair, for example, I would just check again. And to reflect that, I decide to bet big, $1,300 into around 900. L, the original razor, calls in position, but KGB gets out of the way. So we go heads up to a river looking for some help, and we kind of get that. It's the nine of hearts, improving me to second pair, but also bringing in a possible flush. At this point, I think my hand is a little bit too strong to bluff with, but at the same time, not strong enough to bet for value. So with that in mind, I decide to check and see what L does and I'm happy to see he checks it back. I turn it over and we're good. So not a huge pot or anything, but good start to the night. In the following hand, the straddle is on once again. There's two limpers before I look down at king nine suited in late position. Good enough for a raise, I think, so I make it $500 to go. The straddle makes the call and so does the first limper. So we're gonna go three ways to a flop, which is a very welcome sight. Ace nine nine, giving me a somewhat hidden three of a kind. Action checks to me and I continue with the small bet. The straddler gets out of the way, but the first limper makes the call. So it looks like we've got some action. Unfortunately, we see the worst turn in the deck. It's the ace of diamonds. So if my opponent has an ace, obviously we are losing now. However, when he checks it over to me a second time, I think it's still worthy of a bet, mainly because my hand is fairly strong and I would still wanna be doing this with quite a few air balls. So once again, I decide to bet. No need to go too large, just $800. Not that that's a small amount of money or anything, but you know, relative to the size of the pot. And it looks like once again, my opponent is coming along for the ride as he puts in the money. Off to a river card now, which is the Jack of Diamonds. My opponent checks a third time and at this point, I think I'm just gonna check it back. Not really interested in trying to get my opponent to fold a better full house. So that's what I do. And as it turns out, we're gonna win this one as we were up against pocket eights. I'm not entirely sure why he called the bet on the flop as his hand was counterfeit. I think maybe there was a little bit of confusion going on, but either way, no complaints on my end as we take down another pot and move right along to the next one. 
In this one, there's a race to $150 before Ryan makes it $500 in late position. Action gets to me in the big blind, and I look down at pocket queens. I know the graphic doesn't pick that up here, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Pretty strong cards, so I'm going to raise it up myself. Make it $1,400 to go. The initial raiser folds, but Ryan decides $1,400 is not enough, and instead makes it $4,000 to go. At this point, I don't really think I want to put in another raise, but at the same time, I don't want to fold. My hand is just way too good, so... I put in the call and we go to a pretty good flop of 5-3-3. Nothing out there that is really too scary for my pocket queens, but at the same time, if he's got aces or kings, we're uh, in a sticky situation. I check it over to him and he continues with a really small bet of $1,500. I think against a bet that small, it's okay to have some raises, particularly with pocket pairs that need a little more protection like queens or jacks. If I had a hand like aces or kings, I'd lean more towards calling, but with queens, I think I want to put in a raise. Could also mix in some occasional bluffs with this play, such as small suited aces or perhaps ace king myself. Anyway, I make it $3,500 to go. And much to my surprise, Ryan ends up folding top pair, which considering how small I raised, I'm not really sure I agree with, but I got to give him credit. He was in bad shape, so good fold. And with that, we move to the biggest pot of this particular stream. The straddle is on once again. There's a limp from late position. The small blind limps in as well, and I look down at 9-8 of spades in the big blind. Good enough for a raise, I think, so I make it $600 to go. And now the straddler on my left makes the call. The limper folds, and so does the small blind, so not exactly what I was anticipating, but that's quite all right. We've got a nice hand. Going heads up to, once again, a very nice flop. It's ace, jack, 10 with two spades. Yeah, so quite a lot going on for me. Not only should this be a good board for me with, you know, all those big cards out there, but I've actually got something pretty sweet. It's an open-ended straight draw as well as a flush draw. All those reasons are going to amount to me betting, so that's what I do. But Jay's not done with it just yet as he sticks around with a call. So we're off to a turn card looking for some help, and it does not come. It's the 10 of clubs. Not exactly what I was looking for, but of course, like I mentioned, this is a good board for me and I'm going to continue betting, hopefully putting his hands like King Jack or Queen Jack in a tough spot. Maybe even just a single ace is not going to be in love with the situation here. So with all that in mind, I decide to size up now $4,000 to go. But once again, Jay decides to put the money in. So we're definitely looking for some help now. And there's lots of outs that could bring that to us. What do you know? That's what we get. The deuce of spades giving me a fairly, I think, hidden flush. Given that there's the ace and the jack of spades out there, I would almost never have a flush draw here. So that paired with the fact that it definitely looks like he's got something after calling pre-flop on the flop and on the turn. I'm going to size up here and try to get some value. The pot is just over $11,000. So I decide to bet out $11,000, a pot-sized bet. And I'm happy to see we don't get snap called. So that's always a good sign. He's in the tank, thinking it over. Seems to be in a lot of pain with the situation. Not an easy decision for him, it seems. But after thinking it over for a few minutes, he decides to finally call. So that's going to be good news. I turn it over, announcing a flush. And we're up against a full house, Pocket Jacks. <sighs> rather heartbreaking, not going to lie to you guys. After him thinking it over for so long, I thought we would definitely win this one. But as it turns out, I think my opponent was a little bit worried about seeing pocket aces, perhaps, or pocket tens, which, you know, it happens sometimes. So credit to him for thinking it over. Unfortunately, this one is not going our way. And it's a pretty big pot, which mostly defined how this session went. But that's okay because there are two more streams to go over. So let's fast forward 24 hours to the following night. Once again, I bought in for $50,000 and got involved pretty early on with Queen Jack from middle position. Straddles on, so I open it up to $300 and get re-raised by the small blind, but only to $800, so a pretty small size. Typically, I wouldn't be calling another raise with Queen Jack off suit, but... In position, and like I said, getting a good price, I make the call. We go heads up to a flop of King-10-4 with a flush draw. So we flop an open-ended straight draw. Either an ace or a nine would be a very welcome sight. 
When my opponent bets $700, I think I'm happy to just continue with a call. Considering that this board is pretty good for him, I don't really want to face another raise and you know not get a chance to see the turn card. So I make the call, and we get no help in the three of hearts. This time, though, my opponent decides to check. At this point in the hand, I think you could make a case for both checking back or starting to bluff right now. I've played with this particular player a few different times, and I've noticed that when he slows down and checks, he's typically trapping or at least doing it with a hand that he's happy to continue with. As you guys can see, that's not exactly the case here as he's got eight high. In fact, I'm pretty surprised he didn't continue to bet on this turn card, but in the moment, I figured he would be doing this with a king or some sort of showdown value and a bet wasn't going to accomplish much. So I decided to check it back and take the free card. And it seems like that was not the right idea because it's an offsuit five. So now we arrive at this river with queen high. However, my opponent checks it a second time. Well, I'm definitely or most likely not going to win if I check back now. So time to go for it. Not really sure how credible my story is, but I guess I could have some strong hands that occasionally check back the turn. So I put in $3,000 and after a few seconds, he folds. As you guys can see, we got this one through as my opponent river to five. Luckily, it went our way, but I would not have been surprised to see him call, I'll tell you that. Anyway, we move on to the next hand where there's an open from Garrett on the button, and I look down at ace seven of clubs in the small blind. Usually a hand that you could go either way between calling or raising with. This time, I choose the aggressive option and raise it up, considering that Garrett can open almost any two cards on the button. But it looks like that was the wrong idea because Garrett now raises again, up to $1,800. Now we're in a sketchy situation. On one hand, we've got a pretty good hand that plays well post-flop and I guess could still be ahead, but on the other, we're out of position against a guy who could have either a very good hand or just a complete bluff. Uh, kind of close, but I decide to call and we go to a flop of jack, three, deuce, with one club. I check, he bets small, and considering that ace high is still gonna be good a lot of the time, I make the call. The turn shouldn't change much. It's an offsuit three, so if ace high was good on the flop, it's probably still good now, right? However, Garrett's not going to make it easy on me. Once I check again, this time he sizes up to $11,000, around 150% the size of the pot. Like I said, uh, I know this player somewhat well. I've seen him play quite a lot on stream. I'm not going to presume to know what he's doing all the time because I definitely don't, but I think I've seen enough to know that sometimes, or at least often enough, ace high will be good here. And if not, at the bare minimum, it's good for entertainment on stream. So I make a somewhat questionable call here, knowing he could still have hands like king or queen high. Sure, sometimes I'll be screwed, but like I said, I'm willing to live with it. Anyway, we go off to a river now with a somewhat dangerous situation underway. And we river top pair, but it does bring in the flush and a possible straight if he was somehow getting out of line with like 5-4 suited before the flop. However, at this point, when the pot is $30,000 and I check a third time, I'm pretty much destined to my fate since I've got one of the best hands I'll have in this situation. So when he bets one third the size of the pot, especially for that size, there's really no decision but to just call. And that's what I do. Unfortunately, as you guys can see, we're up against the same hand. Would have been pretty sweet if he had a bluff, but at the same time, I doubt he would bet so small on the river with a hand like queen nine suited, for example. But anyway, I guess I'm just rambling on about this one. At the end of the day, it's a chopped pot, and all that drama is for a $50 profit for each of us. In the next hand, KGB opens from early position to 150, and I look down at queen deuce of spades in the small blind. For those of you who have not heard of my particular hand, it's made famous by Israeli Ron and is widely known around the live at the bike streets as the Iron hand. So trying to pay homage to him and also considering the fact that I've been pretty quiet so I think one of my re-raises will get some credit, I bump it up to $700. KGB seems undeterred however and makes the call so we're going to go heads up to a flop of Jack Jack Deuce with two diamonds. I decide to bet small here, flopping bottom pair. Should be good some of the time and could get some value from ace highs or potential flush draws. My opponent makes the call. Not really sure how I feel about that. We could still be losing to a jack or some sort of medium pocket pair, but sometimes my hand will be best. However, when the turn is an offsuit five, or rather it's a five of clubs bringing a second flush draw, I think I'm gonna go with a check option now, see if he wants to bluff and also pot control with a somewhat marginal hand that could win at showdown. But with all that said, 
KGB completely disagrees with that and bets out for a little over $1,000. Like I said, still beating some random bluffs and flush draws. So I make the call and what do you know? We see a deuce on the river giving me a full house out of nowhere. Still, I don't really see any value in betting, so I check it again, and KGB wastes no time in announcing all in. Well, I only lose to a better full house now, which of course is possible, but I am beating every other possible hand, so I quickly make the call. And as you guys can see, that was the wrong call as KGB flopped trip jacks and river top full house. So nice hand to him, and this time the queen deuce suited does not work out. At this point, I get nothing playable for quite a long time, I wonder if it looks to my opponents like I'm only playing really good cards, but I'm just not really getting anything until finally looking down at King-9 offsuit in middle to late position. Not really ideal, but I do open it up and get immediately raised by the button. Now, like I said, I haven't played a hand in a while, and I think my hand in particular is a good candidate to occasionally get feisty with. By occasionally, I mean almost never, but sometimes I think it's all right, and this is going to be one of those sometimes. This opponent in particular uh, was playing pretty fit or fold after the flop, and I also caught some weak vibes when he re-raised me in the first place. So I kick it up to 1600, and after a little bit of thought, he makes the call. So we're going to go heads up to a flop of 884. Pretty good flop, I think. Shouldn't really connect with either of us, which means that I should theoretically still be ahead with hands like aces and kings. And if he does have a hand like Ace King or, you know, any other sort of big letter cards, he's probably going to fold right away. So I continue with a bet of $1,000, but unfortunately my opponent makes the call. However, we get bailed out on the turn with an offsuit Ace. I think at this point it's likely we're up against some sort of middling pocket pair like tens or perhaps jacks, you know, things of that nature. I mean, the story checks out, right? So I think what I want to do here is check it and try to make it look like I'm pot controlling with an ace or trying to trap him. I'm expecting him to check back and then we can go for a bluff on the river. So that's what I do, although I'll be the first to say I definitely don't hate continuing to bet on this card. However, my opponent checks it back and we go to an offsuit seven on the river, which I don't think should change anything unless he somehow has a hand like pocket sevens. So with all that in mind, I think it's time to empty the clip and go for a big bet. If I did have a hand like ace king, aces, a random eight, like, you know, king eight suited or something of that nature, I would definitely go big here. So I think having king high also qualifies. So after thinking it over for a little while, I decide to put out $8,000. Much to my surprise, my opponent eventually calls and turns over an ace. So, you know, kind of unfortunate. Obviously, there's no one forcing me to play king nine offsuit and lose a bunch of money with it, but at the same time, I feel like I got a little bit unlucky in this particular situation. I guess that's how it goes when you play questionable hands. And with that, we move on to the next one. Things definitely not going very well now. Let's see if we can fix that by playing an actual good set of cards. And by that, I mean pocket kings. Another good situation developing here as Garrett raises to $400 and I'm next to act. Definitely going to raise it up so I make it $1,500. And it folds back to Garrett, who makes the call. So we go heads up to a flop in position as well. Unfortunately, it comes ace high. So kind of a reflection of how the night's been going. However, I think I still want to bet small with all my hands. Definitely wouldn't mind checking back, but I decided to bet this time around a third of the size of the pot, $1,000. Garrett makes the call. So we're off to a turn, which is the deuce of spades. He checks again, and this time I'm happy to check it back. And things go from bad to worse as the Jack of Hearts arrives on the river, bringing in a potential flush if he was calling the flop with two hearts. And now Garrett seems to like that card because he bets out $5,000, right around the size of the pot. I've got kings with the King of Hearts, so naturally a very disgusting situation for myself, especially against a player who's capable of having some creative bluffs. But even him, you know, I, I just don't see how he could be bluffing in this situation. I'm sure he could. Although I'm not sure with what hands he would do that with. Maybe he would tell me one day. But in the moment, I just couldn't think of anything that I could beat. So I decided to just fold. It sucks, but I just felt like I was beat. And I could also have many better hands to call with than, you know, kings on an ace high board with a flush out there. So I put my cards in the muck and move right on to the next hand. Which, coincidentally, happens exactly one orbit after that hand, and it's in a very similar situation as well. Folds to Garrett in the small blind, he makes it 300, and I'm next to act in the big blind looking down at ace four of diamonds. Small suited aces I think are good candidates to re-raise with, you know, 
trying to keep it disguised when I do have hands like aces and kings and, you know, the good stuff. So I make it 1500 to go. Now double H in the straddle, looks down at ace queen suited and elects to just call. Action gets back to Garrett now who I would expect to raise with some hands considering that double H called, but he decides to also just call. So we're gonna go three ways to a flop, which comes down pretty good. It's jack six four with one diamond. Well, I guess pretty good is kind of a stretch, but we do flop bottom pair and some backdoor possibilities and we should probably win this hand assuming we're not up against pocket jacks. So with that in mind, after Garrett checks, I continue with a small bet of $1,500, right around a third of the size of the pot. Double H folds his ace high behind me, but Garrett now calls. So we're off to a turn, which is the queen of hearts. Pretty good card, I think. If he had a jack, now it's gonna be kind of tough to hang on. And who knows? He could also have hands like pocket eights or pocket sevens that don't believe me for one bet. But now, we can definitely ramp up the pressure as I think this card is much better for me than for him. The pot's right around seven or $8,000 and I think it's time to size up. So I think it over for a little bit before putting out $10,000. Unfortunately, once again, as you guys can see, this is actually a terrible card because not only does Garrett have a jack, but he also turned a flush draw. So maybe if it was another suit uh, like the queen of spades or you know, preferably a diamond, this would have worked. Unfortunately, he can't go anywhere just yet, even for that price, so he makes a call. Looking for a card to continue bluffing on, sadly we get the Queen of Spades. This is just a terrible card. Uh, I'm not really a fan of bluffing when the board pairs on the river. I mean, I think it's fine, but in this exact situation, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. But then again, if I did have hands like Ace Queen, I guess I would go all in. I don't know, it seemed a little bit too sketchy. So after Garrett checks, I decide to just check it back. And of course we lose to a Jack. So another big pot going away from my direction and the night is just not going well. All bluffs are not working out. There's really no value bets to be had. Even hands like Kings aren't really paying off. So you guys know how it goes when nothing seems to be working out. The problem is this is for a lot of money, so not really fun to run bad when you're playing a big game, but that's just how it goes. Nothing you can do but continue to play. And that's what we're gonna do in this next hand as I look down at pocket jacks. Garrett opens on the button. I'm definitely gonna be raising from the small blind, so I make it $1,500 to go. And only Garrett makes the call. So once again, the two of us going heads up to a flop, which you probably guessed it, comes queen high. Queen seven, three rainbow. My hand's pretty decent on this board, but not really good enough to bet, or at least I think it's fine to bet, but I think it's also okay to check, and that's what I do this time. Garrett disagrees and continues with a $1,000 bet. Obviously can't raise, definitely not gonna fold, so I make the call, and we see the six of spades on the turn. Not really a card I love. It does introduce a few two pair possibilities, or perhaps a straight, but for the most part, I don't really think it changes much, so when I check and he bets $5,000, I think we got a call once again. Wouldn't really hate folding at this point. I think it's kind of close, but I definitely don't think calling is poor. So I put in the call and we see the seven of spades on the river. Not exactly my favorite card. Once again, I would almost never expect him to have a seven after betting the flop and the turn, but we do see a backdoor flush come in, which I think he could have at some frequency. And we're obviously still losing to a queen or, you know, pocket threes, hands like that, seven, six suited, etc. So once again, I check, this time he bets $10,000, and as frustrating as it is to be in this situation, I think it's finally time to fold. Just a really annoying spot, knowing that he could be bluffing, but like I said, at the same time, I could have a lot of better hands to call with. Jax is pretty much one of the worst ones at this point. Even though I do have a spade, I do eventually let it go. <laughs> yeah, not a very fun session, but just telling you guys how it went. And with that, we move to the final hand of this particular stream. It's almost not worthy of discussion, but here we go. In this one, there's an open from the button to $300 before Garrett re-raises in the big blind to $1,300. I'm next to act, looking down at King Jack in the straddle. Now, as I've stated before, against players who are capable of re-raising pre-flop with not very good hands, I think it's important to sometimes bluff uh, with hands like these. King Jack offsuit, Ace Jack, Ace Queen, you know, hands of that nature where it makes it less likely they've got something good. So that's what I decide to do here by kicking it up to 3,500. Once again, as you guys can see, I'm running into it. Turns out Garrett's actually got a really strong hand, as unbelievable as that might seem, considering that he's had me beat all day long and we're playing shorthanded. But that's just the nature of the game. It's how it goes sometimes. Luckily, 
he lets me off the hook by putting in another raise. I'm pretty sure if he just called, I would have found a way to lose more money. But at the same time, it definitely did not feel good to punt away another 3500 before ending the session down a bunch of money. But there is a silver lining to all this, and that is that despite losing two days in a row, there is a third chance to make things right. Maybe third time's a charm. Let's see how this third stream goes as I look down at 10-8 suited in late position. It's a new day. It's a new game. Let's see what happens. I raise it up to 150 and right away get re-raised by the big blind to $500. We're not super deep here, but I think my hand is okay to call in position with, especially against a somewhat small size. So I put in the 500 and we go to a flop of 6-3 deuce with one club. My opponent decides to bet small, which on this exact board, I'm not a huge fan of. And I think it does open up the possibility for me to raise. I've got some backdoor possibilities as well as two overcards. So I decided to kick it up to $1,000. I could have hands like any set or four or five suited. So I think it's okay to also raise with 10 high sometimes. We get a seven on the turn after my opponent calls. Pretty good card, not only in giving me a few more outs as any nine now makes me a straight, but it's also the fact that this card should favor me more heavily than him if I was bluffing with a hand like seven, eight suited, for example. So when he checks, I see no reason not to continue betting. This time I put in $2,300, around two thirds the size of the pot, and we get a fold from ace high. So not exactly a heroic bluff or anything, but I'll take it. Next, we play an interesting multi-way pot not something you see a ton of in these games, but anyway, I look down at ace, jack of spades, raise it up to 150 and get three callers. So we're gonna go four ways to a pretty good flop. It's king, queen, four with one spade, giving me the nut straight draw, a backdoor flush draw, and it's also a board that I think should be good for me, right? Since there's all those big cards out there. So when it checks to me, even though it is four ways, I think it's okay to put in a small bet and see what develops. So I put in $200 and get called by only the small blind. Now, he did call with one player left to act behind him, so I think that's generally gonna be a strong hand, or at least strong enough to call, knowing that someone might raise behind, but I don't know what these guys are thinking. So when the turn is a deuce of hearts, I guess he could have a hand like a queen or perhaps a non-believing four. Doesn't seem very likely, but at the same time, it's pretty unlikely that I'm bluffing myself, given how I've played my hand, so. With all that in mind, I decide to put in another bet, this time $1,400, trying to apply some pressure to those middling hands like a weak king or any sort of lower pair than that. But after some thought, Mike doesn't care about any of that because he puts in the money once again. So we're looking for some help here on the river, preferably a 10, but I'll take an ace too. It's a three. Doesn't bring any help whatsoever. And it also makes it even less likely that I would bet a hand for value now that there are some potential flush slash two pair combinations out there, I guess. I yeah, Well, it's not really that likely now that I look at the board, but all that said, I didn't get the vibe that Mike was gonna fold for a pot sized all in. So after some deliberation, I decided to wave the white flag and check it back and he shows King nine suited. So whether or not he would have folded to an all in, I guess is debatable, but I played it safe and uh, he takes this one down. A couple hours later, this hand goes down where Lynn raises to $250 from early position. Edgar calls in late position and I look down at pocket tens in the small blind. Considering that she raised in early position, I think it's okay to just call, but at the same time, tens is a pretty strong hand and we are incentivized to raise a little bit wider since there's a caller behind. So that's what I do this time, making it $1,500 to go. Gets back to Lynn and she makes the call as does Edgar, so we're gonna go three ways out of position to a pretty lame flop. It's king, queen, queen with two spades. Not the best board for tens, so I decide to check. Lynn also checks, but Edgar disagrees with that and puts in a bet of $2,400. Now it's back to me, and if I was heads up, I think it's okay to call since I doubt he would bet a strong hand like this, but with Lynn behind me, knowing she could very well have a hand like king jack or even a queen, it seems irresponsible to call, so I let it go as does Lynn. So as it turns out, I could have called and maybe won the pot somehow, but you know, hindsight's 2020. And as it turns out, Edgar wins it with a cool bluff. So nice hand, sir. You know what hand is a lot easier to play than pocket tens though? Pocket aces. That's right. I finally get a really good hand dealt to me. Of course, I'm going to be raising it up. The straddle is on. So I make it $300 and we see a very welcome sight as Mike re-raises from the small blind to 2,200. 
Yeah, he's got seven deuce offsuit, but before you guys jump down his throat, we were playing the seven deuce game, which means if you win a pot with seven deuce, either at showdown or by just making everyone fold, you get 100 or $200 from everyone. I forget the exact bounty, but he's incentivized to do this. Unfortunately for him, he's running into a hand that is definitely not going to fold. So I think it's between calling or going all in for me. Since he already put in like two thirds of his stack, I just decide to go all in which is bad news for him, of course, but since he's already put so much in there, he's pretty much obligated to call with even seven deuce, as he does. So we go to a flop, which is not the best thing ever, seven, six, six. So he can still win this one with another seven. The turn is a deuce, which gives him more outs. Now any deuce will do the trick as well, but we see a three on the river. Our aces hold, and just like that, we take down a pretty sizable pot in what has otherwise been a somewhat uneventful day. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we move to the last interesting hand of the night and of the vlog. There's a raise from early position to $600. Might seem like a big size, but there was a double straddle on this hand to 200. And I look down at ace-jack offsuit in late position. Not really a hand that I'm too thrilled about calling a raise with. In fact, I think folding is even fine, but it is a live stream game. People are playing a little bit wider than normal and come on, it's ace jack. It's a good hand. So I decide to raise it up instead, making it $2,000 to go. Action gets back to Edgar, who of course makes the call with seven deuce offsuit. Well, I guess of course is a little bit too lenient, but you know, the seven deuce game is on and all that. So he makes the call and we go heads up to a flop, which favors him. It's nine, eight, seven. So he's got a pair. I don't. It's also not a good board for me, so when he checks, I decide to check it back. We do have two overs and I guess a straight draw, so there is some hope, but that's not what we get as the three of spades comes on the turn. Once again, he checks it over to me. I don't really expect to get a fold from a better hand at this point on a board like this, so I kind of surrender and check it back. But what do you know? We finally get somewhat lucky, if not very lucky, on this vlog as the 10 of diamonds appears on the river, giving me a straight with my jack. Even better news is that now my opponent leads out, but it's pretty small, $500. I take this as an indication of maybe a pair or two pair, perhaps even the smaller end of the straight. If he's got a hand like queen jack and he's trying to induce me to raise, bless his soul, but I'm definitely doing it. If I had a bluff here, like ace queen, for example, or any other garbage that I decided to try to steal this pot with, I would go big. So that's what I do when I actually have it here, making it $4,000 to go. Now it's back on Edgar, and I think, as ridiculous as it may seem, it's a pretty tough spot for him because I'm either representing a very good hand or nothing at all. And knowing that I sometimes could raise with nothing at all, I'd be tempted to call if I was him. But he ends up folding, which, of course, is the right decision in this case. Even tougher still because there was that bounty to win from everyone if he called and was good. But he makes the right choice and lays it down. Still can't complain about winning a pot with ace-jack after getting outflopped by seven deuce. Anyway, that brings an end to this three-day poker stream extravaganza. As you guys could see, it wasn't the best few days of poker for myself, but either way, as always, I hope you guys enjoyed the hands. Right, so as you guys could see, that didn't go very well for me. The first day I ended up losing around 18K. The second day I lost like 60K, so very rough few days. The third day finally I got some back where I ended up winning around 32,000. So really big swings as is gonna be the nature when you play these big games. The funny part is that like in terms of big blinds, the swings weren't really that big, but obviously the financial amounts, different story. Not much else to be expected, I mean, I've been running pretty hot on these live streams, so another big downswing was always coming. Could have been worse, I guess. But with this session, or these three sessions out of the way, we move to next week where I'm gonna be playing twice on Hustler Casino Live. Both of those games are gonna be pretty big. I think I'm playing Thursday and the Friday game, so if you guys are interested in that, feel free to tune in. If not, no worries, because I'm gonna make a recap vlog from those two sessions, and that'll be the next video you guys see. So. 
Anyway, that's enough rambling. I'm gonna try to have the best hand more often uh, in those next streams than I did in these streams. And who knows, maybe we'll win some money instead of lose like 50K across a few days. That's all I got to say for now, guys. As always, thank you for watching. Thanks for all the support. And if you're ever in Redlands, uh, take a little walk around. There's a ton of cool shops and you know places to eat. Highly recommended. All right, until next time, good luck at the tables. Peace.